Welcome to The Sandbox with Justin Peters, connecting you to the ideas and tools to improve your life. Now let's go. Hey everyone, I'm Justin Peters and welcome into The Sandbox, a podcast for 20-somethings that know life has more for them. Joining me in my conversation today is my good friend, Jared Schuster. And this is going to be a fun one. Jared is a captivating storyteller equipped with tons of engrossing life experiences. Jared is going to take us through his last decade, which includes graduating through the 2008 recession, learning from the yogis in India, a car accident that broke both of his legs, working with the shamans in South America, and much more. And this all started when Jared, less than a year into his career, asked himself the bold question, why can't I retire now? By listening to this episode, you'll also learn about following your intuition, networking practices that work, and questions to help you uncover your purpose. I hope you enjoy my conversation today with the yoga instructor, surfer, life alchemist, coach, firekeeper, Jared Schuster. So, so you're a man of many titles. I mean, you've been uh, called a sales rep before, a yoga instructor, world traveler, founder, surfer. You carry many of these titles. I'm curious, what is the job of a title of yours called firekeeper? Five years ago, I spent a year living in Ecuador. I had a a near-death experience. I had both of my legs broken in a car accident. And my healing process through that, I spent about close to a year in my bed. And I come from a family of very holistic and alternative healers and naturopaths. So we kind of take a different approach to healing. A lot of our work is seeing what happens in our life as a reflection of something going on on the inside of what's not in balance on the inside. So through my healing process, spending all that time in my bed, I had a lot of time of self-reflection and listening and tuning in as to where I need to go to heal aspects of my life that I was not addressing. And so one thing led to another and I call it the universe you could call it God or spirit, whatever you want to define it as, led me to the Andes Mountains of Ecuador, where I went for a 12-day, five-ceremony shamanic retreat, where you work with sacred plant medicine, you work with indigenous shamans, and you're utilizing very alternative healing techniques to really bring up what it is that is stalling and holding you back in your life. After my second ceremony, working with the shamans and the plant medicine, it radically shifted my entire life. I healed 20 years worth of trauma in about 18 extremely challenging and intense hours, but it was the most freeing moment of my life. In that moment, I went to the owner of the center and I expressed my interest in joining the staff there of I needed to do more work on myself. I needed to learn how to show up, hold space and be there for others. So she told me I can come back in a few months. And so I went back to Los Angeles where I was living at the time and I sold everything I owned down to a 44 liter backpack. And I moved my entire life to this retreat center uh, in the Andes mountains. Coming on as a guest or as a staff member was a completely different perspective and angle than being there as a guest. I was, like you said, I was the head yoga instructor there. I have a culinary background, so I was head of the kitchen there. It's 24-7 of counseling and holding space for people who are going through life-transforming experiences. They have come, a lot of people came to the center because it was their, their last shot. They have tried everything that the Western society had to offer them in terms of healing and connecting back with self. And this was their last chance. And I'd say 95% of people found a lot of what they were looking for there. So as I became a staff member and grew with this role, there was a team of 12 of us living on site, organizing and facilitating everything we became close with the shamans and our shamans would come in for each ceremony. They weren't living on site and they would come in and they would do ceremony and ceremony is doing it in the way that our, our ancestors would work with ceremony. 
of sitting in a sacred circle, having a sacred fire, being restricted on water, praying, spending hours praying with tobacco, praying to food without eating it, thanking the universe. So as the staff became more comfortable with the shamans and we built up this, this connection, this, I, I'd say friendship, but it was more of a family bond, they started asking us to fill roles that only members of their tribe have been able to fill in the past. And one of those roles was a firekeeper. And the firekeeper is the person in a ceremony who tends the sacred fire. For my experience working with the fire, it was during an indigenous sweat lodge or a temascal. And in a sweat lodge, it's four different stages. Ours would go probably about eight hours long and you were crammed in like a can of sardines inside of this dome looking tent covered in animal skins. We used wool blankets um, and you heat rocks all day. You build a fire outside of the sweat lodge and you heat these stones that are, I call them like dinosaur eggs. They're just like these monster stones and you build a fire that looks like a uh, like a four by four house. It's about five feet tall fire. If you go to my webpage uh, halfway down, you'll see a picture of, of me as the fire keeper on there. And you heat these stones all day and each round you bring in a certain number of stones. And all day you're working with this fire. Like I said, we work with plant medicine and as a fire keeper in order to connect with spirit and connect with all the guests and everybody in ceremony, you drink some of the plant medicine as well. So you're having this crazy kind of hallucinogenic, but very deep healing experience while you need to maintain these flames that are up to 10, 15 feet tall. You're taking like pretty much a pick and you're digging out stones from this fire one at a time. And you have to follow a certain path in order to bring them to the shaman in the sweat lodge. And you, you take your your pick with the stone on the end and you put it into the door and our shaman would, he had a pair of deer antlers. He would take his antlers and he would put them in the middle of, of the sweat lodge. Like I said, there was 30 people crammed all together like a can of sardines. He would close the flap once the number of stones would be in there and he would pour water on these stones to create steam. And it gets extremely hot and it's a very, it's a purification ceremony. The, the, the sweat lodge itself resembles the womb, your mother's womb. It's about birth and death or death and then birth. It's the full circle of life. So for me, it was, it was one of the most amazing experiences of my entire life. It was the most rewarding and the most humbling. It was the hardest work I had ever done. By the end of the day, you're just you're covered in sweat. You're covered in vomit. Even you're you're covered in soot, you're burned, and it's just, you feel so rewarded that you provided, you provided the essence of the ceremony for everybody, for them to have their experience inside that sweat lodge. So there's so many jumping off points in that story <laughs> there. Awesome story. I, I, I really enjoyed it. Whenever you were asking about the opportunity uh, you know to come back and and work what did that conversation look like did you have to was it was it a simple like hey i want to there's more here for me i want to come back and work this is what i can do was it a back and forth or was it that that one transaction that one conversation and she told you yeah i'll see you in three months it was that one and the thing is that when you're in that kind of space in that environment, it's not like, I just want this job because it sounds fun. Yeah. I was speaking words that weren't my own. I was, it was a calling. And when you speak a calling, the universe responds to it immediately when it's just pure intention that you're speaking from. So as I'm talking to the owner, she already knew she saw something in me. She mm -hmm. saw that, that desire. She knew I was part of the team before maybe I even knew I was part of the team. So mm -hmm. it, it was very effortless. And that's why it was, everything was so smooth. And it, it, there was nerves and there was, you know, it was like confusion when I went back home, should I be doing this? But 
there it wasn't so strong of am I making a bad choice? It was like, no, like there is no other choice. This is the next step of my life. Hmm. So because it was so effortless, that's why I think it was so easy. Effortless ease. Yeah, that's uh, that's really fascinating because researching you, I saw this thread, honestly, throughout your timeline on just following your gut or intuition, or as you call it, the calling, like you, you've meant, you mentioned that a few times throughout your story. So I actually, I want to bring it back to what I'll, I'll label the beginning of your story, 2008, 2009, were in the midst of probably one of the worst recessions, you're graduating college, and you're looking for a job and trying to find at your time, what you thought was was your purpose. Can you walk us through um, what happened in the, that, that year of graduation? Sure. I mean, I think it started junior year. So that would have been, yeah, 2008, 2009, good timing. Mm-hmm. And I, I had always felt a calling, you know, I went to Purdue university and it's a pretty, it's a very good school. It's a big 10 school, but it's very more conservative and conventional, like a lot of the universities. So choose your path at an early age set your sights on what the career is, define it. You know, we have to decide at age 14 what our careers are going to be. And that never gelled with me. And I never, I was grateful because my family never put those expectations on me. I kind of started to do it myself, just being a product of my environment in college. So my dream was always to get my degree in business and marketing and then move to Boulder, Colorado. I was like, I want to live a simple outdoor life. I want to hike. I want to work at a restaurant. I'd worked at restaurants my whole life. And it's like, I just want to start there and go from there. So as I started speaking this dream, this was correlated with the recession going on, the housing crisis, jobs evaporated. And then of course, when you're in school, there's all this fear going on. Everybody's talking about jobs. This is, this is consuming our lives. And as I started sharing my dream with people, I would almost get laughed at and they would say, you're just saying that because you can't get a job. Mm. And that kind of lit a fire under me. I don't, I don't know why, but I was just like, yeah, I'll show them. And so I changed my focus and I was like, I'll just start applying for jobs. And I have a really strong background in networking. I'm communication. I love people and connecting with people. I think that's why we're here today, you and I. And so I started reaching out and networking. And like I said, in a time when we had no jobs available, I was flown around our country. Companies spent collectively, I think it was like $15,000 on me, my junior and senior year to fly me around, wine and dine me. And I was selected as one of the only candidates from Purdue to interview at certain organizations, like big organizations. And it was a lot of fun and I was loving that, but nothing was feeling quite right. So by senior year, my, the last company that interviewed me was an education startup in Los Angeles. And I had never been to west of Colorado. And that's why I set my sight on Colorado. I was like, that's, that's the edge of the world for me. That's the most beautiful place ever. And then I got to LA. And in terms of scenery, it was like, holy cow, like the ocean and the mountains. Like, so <laughs> whatever this job is, like, I, I need to get this job. So I interviewed and they gave me an offer. It was, it was my fifth offer, job offer. And I decided to take it. I decided this is going to give me an excuse to get to California. And so I got to California and I worked this job. I was promoted within three months. I was crushing it. it was sales, marketing, business development. I helped them build out a brand new division. And then about nine months in, I hit, I hit burnout. I was just like, Everything that I was holding strong to earlier at university, I was not living up to that. I was not fully in my own element. And I was like, I don't want to do this. I don't want to put in this much time and effort, A, for somebody else's dream. And I don't want to sacrifice my own life in the process. I don't have 40 years to give to hit this holy grail of retirement. And when I started having that conversation with myself, I started thinking like, okay, so what does retirement look like? let me start defining retirement. And at the time I had learned to surf. So I was like, wow, well, I want to do that every day that I'm not going to be able to do that when I'm 70. So I want to surf every day. I want to hike every day. 
I want to have freedom over my time. I want to have flexible money. A couple other things. And, and, and so when, I just, when you were doing this, were you journaling this, writing this down, or were, were you just thinking about this? Was there a process to it, or, or was it just conversations you were continuously having with yourself? A combination of conversations with myself, but mostly writing it down. There's such a power in putting pen to paper. Mm. I suggest that to do for anybody. It helps you vision. It helps you get clarity. And you'll see how fast as you start developing these lists, if you put them in a place where you can remember and see them frequently, and we can get into this a little bit later about manifestation and whatnot, but there's a power in that. And there's been so many times in my life where I've come across these lists later on in my life. And I look down and it's like maybe 10 things. And it's like, check, 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 check. Mm. And it's like, holy cow. Like I created the entire next chapter of my life before I even knew that it was coming. I decided it and I, I found it. And it had, didn't happen just once, it happens all the time. So I left that job feeling burnt out and I ended up working in Malibu, California and at a high-end sushi restaurant for years. And this was such a unique experience because every night I was networking and connecting with our world's rich and famous. People who we are told to idolize and they have it all and they are the epitome of what success is and through bartending and serving and whatnot I started to see the other side of it of like this isn't success this isn't what I've been taught like what school taught me that this is what I should be chasing and it's like this doesn't feel right either and I started feeling kind of really run down and I became getting sick while I was working there and then the calling, a new calling came. That was my first kind of calling. And that was, I needed to travel. And at that point, I was like, okay, what does that look like? And I kept hearing three months. You need to take three months. That's going to be the most rejuvenating amount of time for you. So I was but like, what, okay. What, what was your months. experience traveling before that? Had you been out of the country or done any um, extensive traveling? Not much. And my family laughs about it because I was really anti-traveling growing up. I was very comfortable in my comfort zone. My sister's the traveler. She actually lives in Spain. And my family, when I was 12, we took a family trip to like a resort in Venezuela. And so right when I graduated college, I visited my sister in Spain and it was, it was okay. I mean, it was a great trip. It was cool to see her in her world, but I wasn't like I had a girlfriend back home at the time and I was so focused on the long distance love and it's like internet wasn't as strong. So I was at internet cafes all the time and <laughs> it, it was what it needed to be, but it wasn't, it didn't spark the travel bug. Hmm. So I didn't have much experience or drive and this was just new. It was like, I need to get out of my comfort zone. I need to leave the States. It's time to explore our world. It's time to explore new cultures. It's time to explore myself. So that's, I took three months and I, I went to Europe and I took the pretty stereotypical 20 something year old European dream trip of different hostels every two days, different countries every two days, partying, connecting. It was life-changing. Mm -hmm. Side it, note. Mm -hmm. Go ahead. Just side note story on that real quick was before I was going to go, I was supposed to go with a really good friend of mine and I was building it up in my mind of him and I were going to have this experience together. And that provided me so much comfort knowing that I was going to do this trip with somebody else. And two weeks before we were supposed to go, he bailed on me. And for anyone listening, this is why I find this story so important is to really listen to your calling to go to just go and trust because i even asked my mom i was like i don't think i'm gonna go like i don't want to do this alone my biggest fear was being alone something that a lot of people are very afraid of of sitting with themselves of what is it going to look like i don't want to show up at a hostel like alone with my backpack and i don't who how am i going to talk to people i don't know any of these languages and she's like, you're going like, there, there's no way I'm not, I'm going to let you not go. You, you have to go on this trip. Mm. And the second I landed on that plane, my first stop was Rome, Italy. I say that the hardest thing for me in that trip was finding time for myself to be alone. 
because I was surrounded by people at all times. And I found instantly why I was supposed to be there. It all started making sense. It's like showing up alone. I had freedom over everything. I had ultimate control over my day, my schedule, my time, what I wanted to do, who I wanted to surround myself with. And there's a whole community of other travelers out there who are traveling alone. And then from then on, I did all my trips alone. That's cool. <clears throat> and um, w- something I want to ask you about that I'm curious on, um, because I don't know if this is the same skill set or a different skill set. You talked about being great at connecting, being a great networker. Um, how, what did you learn around networking, connecting with people? You know on your solo trips traveling, you know, that's the, the Vagabond lifestyle. That's a different demographic of people, uh, maybe easier for you connect with, I don't know. And then there's the Malibu high-end sushi restaurant group of people as well. Is, is there threads, similar skill sets to connect with each of them? Or did you find yourself having to use different skill sets to connect with, with these different groups of people? I think it's the same skill set. I think that when you start learning how to network or connect or build community, the underlying thread is to see people as humans, to meet them where they're at of, we don't know anybody's background. And it's like, okay, maybe on the surface, I know how much money you're worth, but does that mean that I need to give my power away to you or I should treat you any differently Mm. and I think that's why I've been so successful is because I try and just see every single human as a human as a brother and sister of this earth that I may have different levels of respect or mentorship as our relationships evolve but initially it's like I'm just going to meet you I'm going to present my full self and that's what's more important is like people whether it's whether you can consciously see it or subconsciously people read through bullshit very Mm -hmm. quickly they know if you're here to to sell them something or if you have a hidden intent or agenda and it's like if you can just start approaching people and fill yourself up and believe in yourself and know that you are full of light and what i have so much to offer this world the connections become so easy and it doesn't matter what their titles are it doesn't matter who they are and then real bonds form. So it's like a lot of the travelers that I met that I've stayed in contact with have gone on and done incredible things. And they're part of my network, but I see them as my soul family, mm. as I do some of the people from Malibu. Mm. And sometimes I have to let some of them go and make room for others. But I really think the work in, in networking is showing up as, as much of your authentic self as you can. Yeah, I, I want to continue this thread of travel uh, and your stories on travel because that is only like part one of three parts, but I, I do want to explore this networking piece a little bit more. Is there, do you have a system for staying connected with so many people? Well, I mean, thanks to social media today, LinkedIn is a great, great way. I think that you have to put in effort like with any relationship. So for instance, back when I was in college, I remember freshman year, uh, a guy from an organization came in and talked to our business class. There's probably 300 people in our lecture hall. And he gave a presentation about his company and what he does. And something told me inside of me of like, hey, write him a thank you email. Mm. And I knew nobody else was because people were interested, but I see people's mindsets and we're very quickly distracted. So it's like, that was great. Okay. On to the next thing. What are we doing tonight? Where are we going? And it's like, go that extra step to connect with people. It doesn't take much effort, but it takes some effort. So I wrote him a thank you email. And then I added just like a little plug and it wasn't, it wasn't a big push. It was just like, I'd love to continue this conversation or as I'm approaching my senior year, I'd love the opportunity to visit what available positions you have open. So I marked him and he responded. And of course he said, man, thank you for writing that. Like nobody else had responded. And that was like first step for me of like, okay, wow, this, this is something I can do is gratitude is so important, but make sure you express it to the presenter. I do this all the time when I go to conferences. Now it's a way to really build your network. So 
I marked in my calendar a reminder just once a year to send a follow-up email. So sophomore year, it was just like, hey, checking in, how you doing? And it's more of, hey, do you make sure you remember me? And that was kind of like what I was going for with it. It was no like, hey, I, I, I need this from you. It's just like, hey, how's business going? How are you? I still think about that presentation you did last year, planting the seed. Junior year, same thing. By senior year, he was so excited to hear from me. He brought me in. He pushed me through HR. He got me an interview and he, he got me an offer. It wasn't a company I decided to work for, but it was like setting the stage three years out. It wasn't this immediate, I need something from you, but it was like, wow, this is somebody who I, I, see, I could see myself being this guy. So it's doing things like that. It's like when you meet somebody who has an impact on you, make sure you tell them. It's mm. as simple as that. People love hearing yes. what you've done for them in their life. They love hearing gratitude and there's not enough of it going on. And I know that's what separates me and, it, and anybody out there, if you start practicing that, that'll separate you from 99% of the other people out there and will expose you to opportunities beyond your wildest dreams. Mm. I, I don't think LinkedIn people makes it so easy now. Yeah, I agree. I don't think people just, and, and if you weren't listening, if that didn't resonate with you, I would suggest rewinding it two minutes and listening to this over again. Cause that was such a gold nugget right there. It is so true. Just that X, that little extra step. And then owning the follow-up process from there forward too. Um, just staying connected, staying on people's radars. Um, and, and you're, you're right. I like the fact that you said, if somebody made an impact on you, let them know. Um, and, and that's how you get that, you know, genuineness out and you stay connected with people that really mean something to you. You actually got me onto a practice. I don't know if you remember telling me this or not, but, um, you told me that every time someone new on LinkedIn connects with you, you just send them a little note. And if you don't know them, Hey, I would love to, um, get to know each other a little bit. If you want to just make introductions over zoom or over a phone call, I'd love to do that sometime. And you do that for all of your new connections that resonated with me. And I'm doing that practice. Now I set up just a, a, a Calendly, um, where, and I, I made some, um, space every single week where I just, it's general networking for me. And I legit have four to five conversations every week now with new people. And most of them come through that simple, I do it on Instagram now as well, um, through Instagram and LinkedIn, just, hey, curious um, how we know each other. It, I see this common connection between us. Would love to just learn a little bit more about you. If you got 15 or 20 minutes, here's my calendar, book some time for us so that we can, we can get to know each other more. And you taught me that practice and it has worked wonders just meeting some really awesome people. So cool. Yeah, I call it the, for me, it's called 30 minute, no hidden agenda, meet and greet. Mm. And the benefits are as you're experiencing them of a lot of people I've talked with, they're like, oh, but what if it's awkward? The what ifs like, and it's like, yeah, I, I have awkward conversations quite frequently with people, but I have some core questions. Again, there's no hidden agenda. It's what's your story? What got you to today? Let me share my story. And then we're going to see if there's any common ground for us to support each other. And if there's not, at least I know you in my network now. And down the road, I'm going to see, we're going to grow together virtually through LinkedIn, but there's always going to be that thread of like, oh, I, I actually met that person as opposed to just this picture and some words underneath them. Yes. And that the, this practice, especially during what we're experiencing now of us all kind of having to sit still and be at home. This is an awesome practice to just build community. Some of my best friends and mentors as of late have come from doing these 30 minute meet and greets and just saying yes, just saying yes to the appointment and showing up. You know, you can't back out of them. Mm -hmm. You have to just schedule it and you have to give each other that time and focus and the presence. And it's mm -hmm. amazing what comes out of some of these conversations. Yeah, agreed. And I, I love COVID for the fact that it's actually really normalized meeting new people through Zoom. Like just a lot, like it's really allowed us to be like, hey, we should get to know each other. I know we can't do it face to face right now. I'd love to just connect over Zoom. And that allows me to, uh, you know, now it's, it's not this like 30 minute drive to a coffee shop or I like, it's not this two or three hour commitment to meet people. Like I can meet two or three people in a matter of an hour, hour and a half 
uh, in one day. And I really enjoy that piece to it. And if I want to continue the conversation, I can pull it offline or find another way to connect with them. So that's super mm -hmm. awesome. I want to pick our story back up though, this travel story, um, that first European trip, like I was saying, was only really part one. Then what happened? So you come back to the States and can you walk us through um, the next phase or, or part of your journey here? Yeah, so I, I came back to the States, like you just said, and I was I was on this high. I was like, I have this travel bug. It hit me. And it was like, where, where to next? But I wasn't ready to go anywhere yet. I started falling back into the same habits. You know, I've been lucky in my life that I've worked for some great people. It's also a product of the work that I've given them that I've been able to take these big chunks of time. And honestly, when I ask for time off, it's usually non-negotiable. It's like, if you kind of, if you don't want me back, this has been a great experience, but I have to go. Yeah. So, but if you want me back, awesome. Cause I'll be back and I'll be such a better employee because you gave me that time. I'll be so much more dedicated. And these are, these are words that I actually use when those conversations come up of like, I need to rejuvenate. I want to provide for your organization as a better folder me. And this is what this time will provide me to do. Mm. And it's amazing. I have friends who have asked and they, their employees are like, no. And it's like, well, maybe it's time to find somebody who values your time. Because if you're going to give years of your life to a company, the least that you can get is a couple months of time off to go find you so you can be the better you for them. Mm. So anyways, I come back and I started falling right back into old habits of I was working a ton. I was exercising a ton. I became getting sick again. I was taking on so much of kind of the toxicity of that work in the restaurant of things that were just really bogging me down before my first trip. And then it was like, okay, at, at six, uh, I think it was a year later, I was like, it's time, it's time for the next chapter. What does that look like? And it's like, okay, I got the partying out of my system. I got the meeting a thousand people out of my system. What do I need to do? Mm -hmm. And the, the top two things, for some reason, it was like, okay, you're going to go to Thailand first. You're going to go explore the Buddhist culture of Thailand. You're going to explore the food. You're going to go explore the jungle. And of course, I start, I needed to chase the endless summer. And on everybody's bucket list, if you're a surfer, is Indonesia because that's yeah. surf Mecca. So it's like, okay, I'm going to go to Thailand for a while. And then I'm going to go to Indonesia. And then I don't know, but I'm going to take at least six months. So I did that, took six months off, went to Thailand, spent like two full months there. It was, man, Thailand was, oh, beautiful people, just the food, the daily massages. It's like, it's unreal. And it's just, it's magic. It's a magical place. I mean, all of um, Southeast Asia was just so special. And then I went to Indonesia and I chased the surf and lived just this awesome surf lifestyle and met people. And then it was Christmas day and I was sitting in, uh, this little room that I had rented and I just started looking at a world map and I was like where where to next I have three months left of this trip and wh where where am I supposed to go I'm kind of done surfing right now I need to to rest my body and I saw how close I was to India and it's like again it was like there was no question all I could see on that map was India and I was like holy cow I'm this close I didn't even know and so it took a lot of finagling to get a visa for India. It's harder to get a visa when you're in a foreign country trying to go to another foreign country. But again, everything fell into place. I flew where I needed to go. I, I did what I needed to do. And I got my visa. My intention for going to India, and I knew right away, was this is my soul journey now. This is where it begins. This is what I've been desiring. This is where I'm going to start studying yoga. I came from a family. My mom is a yogi. She was teaching and practicing yoga before it was the big thing that it is today. And it was, and I had developed a practice living in California, but it wasn't so deep. I was like, I, I'm going to go to the source of what this is. So I booked myself into a 30 day, 200 hour, hour yoga intensive teacher training. And it was awesome. And, and for people that don't know yoga, what is there a comparison that you can make there? Because when you say 200 hours, I, what is that for for a layman that hasn't really gone through any kind of certificate yoga certification training? 
Well, for one, the 200 hours doesn't mean so much. The 200 okay. hours is a, is a staple that we put to it in the Western world. It's like accredited. It's like you're getting your bachelor's degree. Hmm. So you put in time in school, you go through years of schooling, you, you have your focus in your major, it's getting your major. So there's an organization called Yoga Alliance, and they've made actual standards for to make yourself more, I guess, professional in this space to be a teacher here. It's a certification. Okay. So the hours don't mean so much. But what I went through was we were up at like 5, 5, 5.30 every single day. We would do a two-hour very physical yoga practice, have a 30-minute breakfast, then we would do another one out, one to two hour yoga practice. We would study anatomy. We would do a philosophy class with a true Indian yogi who has, mm. he has dedicated his entire life. He's born into this sect of being a, a real yogi, very different than the yogis we have in the United States here. And then we would have lunch and then go right back into every day was probably eight to 10 hours in the Indian sun. I mean, there's, there's no AC. It's like, you're dealing with hundred plus degree weather, dirt, what just raw. And we're practicing ancient yoga techniques while merging it with this new Western philosophy of yoga. So body alignment, anatomy, how to actually teach it. We would do cleansing techniques, um, you know, pouring stuff up your nose and cleaning out your, through your throat and, just lots of stuff like that, but day in, day out for 30 days. So you're eating very minimally, you're meditating, you're practicing, and it's just, it's just an immersive, it's an immersive experience. Th through that experience, what did you learn maybe outside of yoga through those 30 days, either through the yogi or maybe through your cohort? Because I'm assuming you had a fairly diverse cohort or was it mostly people from India? No, it was actually people from all over the world. I learned that yoga is meant to be shared when it's, when it's needed to be shared, but the practice of yoga is very much for the self. Mm. And as I mentioned a little earlier about the, the accident that I was in, having my legs broken, I came back from India. I came back from that trip and I was home for two weeks and I was, I was on this spiritual high. I mean, I had just, I did the 30 day experience. And then I spent two months traveling around India and just like seeing the most sacred sites, connecting with the most beautiful people ever, just having an India experience. And so I came back and I was like, I'm going to be a yoga teacher. I'm ready to share my, my gift. And I, the universe wasn't ready for me to share it. Hmm. And so my biggest takeaway from my training was to strap me with the tools necessary to get me through me being stuck in a bed for close to a year. That's where my yoga training came out. It wasn't about me coming back to instantly go to a studio or start teaching or build my own thing. It was like, no, you need to have this experience because in about three months from when I had it, you know, this is the universe plotting things out for me of like, you need to have this first because you're gonna go through something that's gonna be very, very challenging. And you may not be able to get out of it if you don't get these tools first. Yeah. The uh, actually, let's talk about the the car accident. The I, I've heard you tell a little bit of the story about it. Um, so if you want to share that, I would love to hear that. But the accountability that you take for the accident is what is really interesting to me. Can you speak on that a little bit? Yeah. So. The short end of the story was I was driving home from work. It was about 10 p.m. I'm driving on Pacific Coast Highway and somebody was texting and driving in the other lane and he swerved and he hit another car and it caused his car to turn and hit me head on. And I, I was gone. I, I had a near death experience. I, I was blacked out and I woke up with my legs crushed and I could smell I just knew the fire department was around. And I remember having a short conversation with a firefighter and saying like, I can't move my legs, I'm stuck. And he just said, we're working on getting you out. And then I blacked back out mm. and then I woke up in the hospital. Part of my healing journey and a lot of things and traumas that I've been through in my life is this self-acceptance piece of 
as I tell that story and as people and yourself are picturing it, we automatically think this was this guy's fault. This man was at fault who he was texting. Jared was not at fault. I had, it was, you know, and on paper and when you get into the legality, it's like, no, I was not, I was not at fault on a physical sense. But when, when we really are ready to heal something in our lives, we have to take on responsibility for every experience that we've had. So I do this a lot today, this practice of like, why did I attract this experience? Why did this accident happen for me? When I speak on COVID, this is a really awesome opportunity for people to say, why did COVID happen for me? Mm. And it allows you to practice some mindfulness and step outside of yourself and this victim stage and look at yourself and, and start seeing the silver linings of it. So I was not living a healthy lifestyle. I was ignoring a lot of signs. I was living so this fast track lifestyle. I was chasing money and fame. And, and you know, there's a part of me who was really attracted to the Malibu lifestyle as well. That's why I kept going back and kept you know, putting my toes in that water over there. Mm. And it was like, I kept hearing, you need to slow down, you need to slow down, you need to slow down. And it was like, nah, nah, I'm gonna, I'm, I'm living this life. I don't need to, I'm on top of the world right now. And, and then I say, you know, the universe took a two by four to my body and told me, if you're not going to listen, we're going to make you listen. Mm -hmm. And it was the same thing. You know, I, I lost my father when I was, I was young to, to AIDS. That was the first pandemic my family had lived through. Mm -hmm. And the hardest thing for me, it took me 20 years. That was part of my healing in Ecuador. But the hardest piece of that healing was the acceptance of why did my dad have AIDS? Why did he choose me, why did I have the experience of my dad having AIDS? How come I'm taking responsibility for it? Again, I had nothing to do with him contracting it and having it, but I own it because it's my experience that I lived through my own eyes. So same thing with the accident. It was that moment of like, yeah, I spent time in the victim stage and it was like, I'm mad at this person. This person has ruined my life. I can't do anything that I love to do. Surfing's gone, hiking's gone, work is gone. I'm stuck in this bed. And then at some point it's like, well, is this person sitting in their bed wallowing in their self-pity? And I don't know, but it feels way more freeing to say, okay, why, why did this happen for me? What is there to learn for me? And once I shifted it to that mindset, man, did things propel the healing, the physical healing started healing in record time. Doctors were absolutely amazed. I almost had to have a leg amputated or one of my feet amputated. Wow. And everything started healing. I was led to the next thing, to the next thing, to the next thing, brought me to right here, right now, today, fully healthy, ready, present, happy, you know, with so many tools under my belt. And it's like, I've needed it all. So it's like, this is where gratitude comes in. Like, can you say thank you to an experience like that? Because I do. It's like, I'm grateful that this car accident happened. I'm grateful that it slowed me down. I wouldn't wish it on my worst enemy, but I'm so happy it happened to me. I'm grateful I had the experience of my father passing away at a young age. It's been the hardest thing. I still battle it, but it's like, thank you. Thank you. Because it's made me into who I am today. I'm so grateful for that. Mm. Yeah. You brought up your father. How did you, how did you communicate about your father's death growing up? Like when you were a child and children ask sometimes, um, you know, the questions, the blatant questions they ask, you know, I'm assuming you, you were asked about your father through your peers at some point in time. What did you, what did you say about that? I'm again, I'm grateful for the family or for the warrior that my mom was to my sister and I growing up. As he was dying, we got very involved in the AIDS organization. My mom became an educated AIDS speaker. So she went around to, excuse me, she went around to schools teaching people about, about the disease. Uh, I wrote essays. We made an AIDS quilt. There's this massive quilt. I encourage people to just Google the AIDS memorial quilt. It's, it takes up like miles and miles and miles and everybody submits a full size quilt and they stitch it together. And it's like the coolest project. And so right. like we became very comfortable talking about it. We were ostracized initially. We, we got forced to move out of our childhood home. Our neighbors pretty much said we're not allowed to play with their kids. Families Why? were terrified. Ignorance. Uh. And it's like, you can't blame them. But 
it's kind of what we're experiencing right now of like, there were no facts in the nineties, early nineties and late eighties about HIV and AIDS. Was it contracted through air? Is it saliva? What if, you know, so it was so hard. It was something our family needed to live through and grow from and get our, our warrior suit from. But so there was that piece of like community. We weren't welcome in certain places because of what my dad had been through, mm. but you, again, you spend time with that and it's like, don't blame them for them not knowing, you know, Jesus says something like that, of like judge them for they, for they do not know. And it, that, those words, they ring very true to me. I don't identify with a certain religion, but I identify with, with Jesus and they, what he, what he speaks. And it's like, you can't, you can't be angry towards somebody because they're living in a state of fear. And so, but back to your question of like, I was, I've been very comfortable talking on it. I'm very passionate about it. World AIDS day is December 1st. It's going to be a neat event. It's all virtual this year, but it's just, we know more now, like in five years, we're going to look back on COVID and we'll be like, wow, we know a lot more now. Yeah. So true. Um, and I think that gets us to maybe our, our, our final topic as we come to the conclusion of our conversation here, and that's purpose. And we've touched on it here and there throughout this entire story or journey of yours. And it started with this um, young, ambitious, you know, college graduate looking to make his impact through his career. And now I look at you and everything you've experienced and the things that I know that you're passionate about First, let's start with, can you define in your eyes what purpose is? This is my favorite thing to work with people on. This is what I coach people on is purpose. Purpose is, is the moment where you tune in and tap into your soul's highest calling. It's when you feel most in flow. It's when the whole world of heaviness disappears around you and you're able to fully give your hundred percent. And that's the key word to me when you're talking about purpose is you're able to give a hundred percent. To me, purpose is understanding who you are so much that you're able to give it back to the world. The more you give, the more you receive. There's a quote by uh, this, one of the OGs of self-development, Zig Ziglar. And he says, you can have everything you want in this life but first you need to help others get what it is that they, what they want. Mm. And I live by that. To me, that's purpose of like, how can I help somebody else? How can I be my best self to help you achieve your goals? Because then it's going to come back to me tenfold. Yeah. Agreed. And um, I'm reading this great book right now. It's, it's impact. Um, It's, it it, kind of lays out the framework for, you know, finding your impact and then creating an, a plan for you to execute on your impact. And I think a lot of people, especially the 20 somethings struggle with the very first part of that. And that's finding my impact or my purpose or my cause or my calling, whatever term you want to use with it. Um, and I think a lot of it starts with really great questions and being introspective. Like, one of the most relevant questions I think you asked yourself at such a young age is why can't I have retirement now? Like when you asked yourself that question, when you were at the startup and then you started thinking and thinking about what retirement looked like and it was surf and it was travel and all of these things. And then you just went out and executed on those goals. How can I start to incorporate more of that in my life right now? you just followed your gut, your intuition. And I feel like you've gotten closer. I don't know if you would say you found your purpose or identified your purpose, but I feel like you're living true to what you currently want to be living. So is there, um, I know this is a meaty question here, so take it any direction you want. Are there other questions you recommend your clients ask themselves to help find their purpose or to find their purpose? Um, or how can somebody start taking the steps to put some definition around what, what their calling is or their purpose is? The first question is what brings me joy? You know, I, I think we've been very much conditioned that purpose is something that to achieve. It's something down the road. Mm. And it's like, 
I'm very in my purpose. I know my purpose, but I know my purpose today. I'm open to it evolving. I'm okay with that. It's when we put these boundaries or set these goals that are so far from it that we, it makes it so hard to attain it. So I say, you know, meditation is a really good aspect because it brings you to the now. It, it lets you reflect on all that you have in this moment right now and that you and everybody listening, you have created in your mind's eye exactly where you are right now. So if you're not happy, it's let's go back. Let's talk about like, what have you done that has not provided joy, but always come back to end with what brings me joy right now, not tomorrow. What am I grateful for right now? What makes me happy right now? That's going to help you start tuning into what the bigger question is. That would be the first thing. Second thing kind of off the side that I like to talk to people is like, if you could change one of the big things going on in the world, whether it be hunger, whether it be climate, whether, you know, for me, it's water. I'm very passionate about clean water. It's like, what is it? Because just, just define it, pick it. If I gave you, you know, $50 million or an infinite amount of money to fix a problem in our world, what is it? Because that's going to help you start again, aligning with what's fueling you of like, what, what am I meant to do here? Who am I supposed to help? And again, it's not like, it's not tomorrow I'm going to fix our water crisis, but I'm very conscious of people I align with that are in that space. And as I'm growing myself, I will be stepping into a space like that at some point in life. Mm -hmm. But I'm very aware of like, what's the project? What do I want to fix? What do I want to fix on a small level in my community? As I look around, who can I help today? Again, the more you give, the more you receive. So how can I always be of service? The last thing is belief systems. It's something that I work with a lot of people on of breaking down our belief systems of, do you really believe in who you want to be? Why do you believe that? Is it a product of what you've been taught and conditioned? You know, our family, our friends, our government, our media, we have been conditioned as to you should have purpose or you should have this figured out. Or you should be at this stage in your life. You should be checking all these boxes. And it's like, does that feel right for you? If it does, wholeheartedly, then great. Keep following that. But if it doesn't resonate and feel good, it's time to own your own power, especially in your 20s. This is your time to break out and define who it is you want to be in the world because you can be anything. Mm. You can be it at any age. If so there's somebody 60 listening right now or 80 listening right now, it's like you can start right now defining who it is you want to be today and who you're going to wake up and be tomorrow. But especially in your 20s, this is the time to just tap into your creativity, tap into the, your creator inside of you and start dreaming and building as big as you can. That's how the internet was formed. That's how these computers were built. It started with this idea in our mind. So what are the ideas in your mind that you wanna to bring to fruition? Because you can, you can, you can really do and have anything you want in this lifetime. You have to let go of these belief systems that you've been taught that you can't, that you're not good enough, the words be realistic, the words grow up, these have been yeah. very damaging things. And it, you know, it's not intentionally damaging. It's just, these are words that have put us in little boxes. And I can tell every single one of you listening, if, if you have found your purpose in paper pushing or whatnot, more power to you, but our, we are not here on this earth to dedicate the majority of our lives to working for Amazon. Like that's not our sole purpose. There is something bigger for you. And that doesn't mean you can't have that job to supplement income to provide more, but there's a lot more out there for you. Don't settle. And that would be probably the last piece right there of like, I mean, I, I built this whole hierarchy on manifestation and creating your dreams. And this is what I, my work is based around, but it's like at the core, you know, that the peak is gratitude. Gratitude is everything always being grateful, but the core is don't settle. Don't let anybody tell you that you've peaked. Don't let anybody tell you that you should settle and just be content. Always strive for what is it that's going to fuel me? What brings me happy? What brings me joy? And what can I offer others? Yeah, that's beautiful, Jared. Um, before I ask my last question, where can people connect with you? You mentioned your hierarchy um, in that last answer there, and you have a, a great guide. So can you tell us a little bit about the guide, where people can connect with you and anything else you'd like to share? So my business and website is called Sparks of Consciousness. Hopefully you'll see it in the show notes. I'd yep. love for you to reach out. 
check out my website. I do a weekly blog, different podcasts. I am just finishing up a eight day, calling it your eight day life alchemy masterclass on manifestation. So each day I teach you a different grounding technique. I believe in the power of grounding before you do any kind of work, whether it's spiritual, physical, emotional work, we need to come to a centered place. So I'm going to share with you eight different grounding techniques. And then we're going to dive into the, that day's theme. The foundation starts with your vision. Let's build a vision together. Let's define success together. Let's accept it. Let's set intentions. Let's go over these words that are thrown around a lot in society, but let's really get into what these words mean and how you can start implementing into your life. Hopefully by the end of this eight day program, you're gonna have a really clear idea of where you're headed. You're gonna be excited for your future. You're gonna have identified more of who you are and what you have to offer the world. So look out for that, sparksofconsciousness.com. Like we talked about earlier, I love connecting with people. I'm not here to push and sell and, and do that whole route. I'm here to make genuine connections with anybody. So if you want to reach out through my website or LinkedIn, I'm very active on LinkedIn. Just find me, Jared Schuster, and, and I'll, I'll, I'll take the first step as long as you friend me. And I'll say, when are you free? Because I want to meet you. No matter who you are, let's just have a talk and see where it goes. Mm, yeah. Yeah, I, I'm excited for the course to come out. I, I saw the guide. It was awesome. I liked the um, difference. You, you were, you know, made the clear distinction between a wish and a manifestation. You gave uh, some tips on how to have more gratitude in your life. You, uh, lots of really good nuggets throughout that. So I, I'd encourage people to go check that out. Um, so Jared, my final question to you, we all have things in our life that we wish we would have started earlier. I think the twenties is whenever you start to realize some of those things, if it's taking care of your body or connecting with people that mean something to you or learning more often or whatever it may be, what's a habit or a practice that you wish that you would have started at 20 years old that you learned later down the road? It's a good question. I think the, the habit for me was just show up. Just do the work. And what does doing the work mean? You know, I, I, I ask myself this question every day and it's been newer over the course of a few years of have I done at least one thing today to move me closer to what it is I'm trying to achieve? Mm. And I think if every day you can answer yes to that, you are on absolutely on the right path, whatever it is you're trying to achieve. And it doesn't need to take a lot of time. It's just putting the energy in every single day. What is one thing that I've done to get me closer to my goals. Mm. And in my 20s, I wasn't quite there. I was running around. I needed those experiences. But I think through sharing our stories, we can learn how to get to places in our lives without having to be there already. So take my stories from my 20s and learn from them so you can be light years ahead of even me from where I was at in my 20s. Mm. So what is one thing that you have done today that has gotten you closer to achieving however you define success. Yeah, that's a, a great piece of insight right there. I've really appreciated this conversation. I love the, conversa the conversation on networking and all the tips that you provided there and the help that you've given me that framework um, on network on, on LinkedIn and Instagram and, and meeting so many new people through just like a simple practice that you shared with me. Love hearing about your travels as always. We didn't even talk a ton about travel tips or anything like that. So if there's people that are uh, maybe starting their, their first big um, travel trip or they might be doing their first solo trip i'd highly encourage people to connect with jared uh and and talk more travel i'm sure you got tons of recommendations or or things like that as well and then i love the thread line on purpose i just you're somebody that i really look up to for that and um i want to continue to have in my life for those reasons so jared thanks for coming into the sandbox i appreciate it man thank you my brother this was awesome Hey, everybody. Thanks for listening. If you like this episode, make sure to subscribe, rate, and review. If this episode brought value to you, share it with a friend and show love on social. You can tag me at Justin Lee Peters. The link to the show notes is in the episode description, and we'll include all the resources we talked about today. This episode was produced by Gabby Dimeke. I'm your host, Justin Peters. Thanks for tuning in, and we'll see you next time in the sandbox.